In the last video we saw that the type of propulsion system has no effect on whether a vehicle produces emissions or not. Every vehicle can create emissions or be fully climate neutral. This is the result of the energy source rule, which tells us that as long as we are using renewable energy, a car will be climate neutral. There are however two other factors that are affected by the propulsion system. These are energy efficiency and the amount of emissions in the case that some energy is coming from a fossil source. Again, let's compare an electric and a hydrogen car as well as a car with a combustion engine. We want to take energy from a renewable source and store it inside the car to power it. There will however always be some energy loss. Energy efficiency refers to what amount of the renewable energy that we are investing actually ends up propelling the car forward. And this amount will be different for these three. It's not really possible to pin down exact and universal numbers, but as a rough guideline we can say that electric cars have an efficiency of about 85%, while for hydrogen the numbers are in the neighborhood of about 25%. For a combustion engine that is running on climate neutral e-fuels, it's real difficult to give an answer, but the efficiency is likely below 20%. So even without exact numbers, we can say that electric cars are by far the most efficient, while e-fuels are by far the worst. This also ties into the second factor, the amount of emissions in case that fossil energy sources are used. For a moment, let's assume that we are using 100% fossil energy. Let's say the electric car is fully powered by electricity from a coal power plant, while the combustion engine is using regular gasoline. Most electric cars require between 0.2 and 0.3 kilowatt hours per mile. Multiplying this with an average 2.2 pounds of CO2 per kilowatt hour for a typical coal power plant, we find that we are producing somewhere between 0.4 and 0.7 pounds of CO2 per mile. At the same time, an average gasoline power car produces about 0.9 pounds of CO2. So we can see that electric cars are the most efficient and create less emissions from fossil energy, while combustion engines with e-fuels perform considerably worse. Because of these numbers, it can be argued that electric cars are the best approach to climate neutral transportation. But it turns out that reality is actually a lot more complicated. There is one crucial question that we have been ignoring thus far. How do we transport renewable energy from its origin, like a solar farm, to the core? This is a map of Australia showing the huge potential for renewable energy in the Australian outback. If we built solar farms in the green circle, it would in theory generate enough renewable energy to meet the entire world's demand for electricity. And Australia isn't the only place like this. Here's a similar map showing solar power across the world. Here too you can see that places like the Sahara Desert in Africa alone can provide far more renewable energy than we need. This is just to give you an idea of the enormous scale of the renewable energy that we can hypothetically generate. But there's a problem. If we want to make use of this energy, we need to somehow transport it from places like the Sahara Desert to big population centers like Europe. Now let's compare what we need to do if we want to transport large quantities of this energy over long distances. One solution would be building large transmission lines. The problem however is that power lines require a cable over the entire distance between two places A and B. This means that the longer the distance we want to cover, the more expensive, complex and generally more difficult it gets. If we want to supply energy to Europe this way, lines have to cover very long distances and a highly branched and dense network has to be built that covers large parts of the continent. Furthermore, large energy storage solutions also have to be integrated into the grid to buffer fluctuations in power delivery and demand. A grid of this scale has never been built, so all our considerations are speculative. On paper it is possible to build such infrastructure and there are concepts for it, but it is certain that such a grid would be enormous, complex and expensive, and it remains to be seen if it can actually be done. There is a not insignificant chance that in practice it's simply not feasible at this scale. 
with hydrogen, the situation is similar. If we want to transport hydrogen, we either need to do it through pipelines or with some sort of tank. With pipelines, we run into pretty much the same problems as with electric grids. And when it comes to storage in tanks, hydrogen needs to be liquefied, which requires cooling to below minus 250 degrees Celsius, or almost absolute zero. For this solution, we would need a large number of tanks and other equipment, all specially designed for hydrogen. The process of storing and transporting hydrogen in tanks is very complex and expensive. And doing this on a large scale is perhaps not feasible either. With e-fuels, however, the situation is different. Since e-fuels are already in a liquid state, they can be stored in much simpler tanks. In fact, we know that such a solution is feasible because this is exactly what we are doing right now. Currently, petroleum-based fuels like gasoline are transported by things like tanker ships to places far away from where the crude oil had been extracted. This works because the tanks are simple, and even if two points A and B are far apart, there is no permanent connection necessary. The infrastructure needed is far simpler and less expensive. That's why e-fuels can be used to transport large quantities of energy from places like the Sahara Desert to faraway locations like Europe. Overall, this means that electric cars and hydrogen have to rely mainly on local energy sources. The further away an energy source, the more difficult it gets to supply that energy to an electric or hydrogen powered car. E-fuels, on the other hand, can use pretty much any source they want without restrictions. There are these massive energy sources like the Australian Outback or the Sahara Desert that can really only be feasibly used by e-fuels. This means that e-fuels may have a lower efficiency, but they also have much larger energy sources that only they have access to. Electric cars and hydrogen may be more efficient, but they also have to get by with a much slimmer energy supply. Furthermore, in most regions of the world that don't have too large of a potential for renewables, electric cars and hydrogen actually lose some of their efficiency advantage because they have to rely on local energy. Let's take Central Europe as an example. This is a region that is relatively poor on renewable energy. It's not particularly windy here and solar power isn't as effective as it is in other places. But because electric and hydrogen have to rely to a large extent on local energy, they have to be powered by these less efficient sources. So the cars themselves may be more efficient, but the wind turbines and solar panels that supply their energy are far from reaching their full potential. Don't get me wrong, the overall efficiency is likely still higher than the one of e-fuels, but the difference probably isn't as drastic as it might seem on first sight. So we can see that the argument that e-fuels are inefficient, while definitely true, has to be taken with a grain of salt. But what about the other thing that we saw at the beginning? We saw that if we do use fossil energy, electric cars produce less emissions. The thing is, cars with a combustion engine can switch to 100% renewable energy relatively easily. Fill their tanks with e-fuels and it will turn fully climate neutral. Electric cars, on the other hand, will, for quite some time actually, still have to rely at least partially on fossil energy. This has to do with the grid. You see, the energy supplied by things like wind turbines or solar panels fluctuates. Wind is constantly changing and solar panels only generate energy during the day and depending on the weather. At the same time, the demand on the grid also fluctuates during the day and depending on the season. In most regions, renewable energy covers a certain base load on the grid. The remaining demand is then covered by things like coal, gas or nuclear power plants because these can adjust their energy output to the current demand. In order for a region to switch to 100% renewable electricity, large energy storage solutions have to be integrated into the grid. Such infrastructure is complex and expensive and takes time to implement. For quite some time, most regions will generate at least some of their electricity with fossil sources. This also means that most electric cars will be stuck producing some emissions. By contrast, cars with a combustion engine can be turned fully climate neutral relatively quickly by filling their tanks with e-fuels. 
In the next video, we will discuss how well different solutions for climate neutral transportation are suited for a large scale implementation.